If the end of the world was upon us, would you be ready? Today, people all over America are stocking extensive amounts of food, water, and ammunition, expecting that at any moment a devastating disaster will strike. These people are called preppers. I'm preparing for the second worldwide Great Depression. For the collapse of society due to peak oil. For a worldwide pandemic. In the next hour, we are going coast to coast to meet the country's most extreme preppers and get a first-hand look inside their truly unbelievable preparations. Tastes like frozen cricket. From massive secret bunkers. This would be a good place to be if chaotic things are happening above ground. And vast food stockpiles. One of my most super secret hiding spaces that only I know about. To over-the-top defense systems and have designed as a last recourse the most intricate bug out plans. Pulling out. For some preppers, this never before seen footage might just mean the difference between life and death. Come on with your hands up. If the world as we know it is ending, they might just be the best prepared. All right, boys, let's go. This is Doomsday Preppers Extreme Prep Edition. Bunkers, bullets, and bug outs. This guy's fun. Survival experts from FEMA to practical preppers know that to survive a major disaster, a substantial and secure shelter is necessary. Bunker sales increased as much as 1,000% for some companies in 2011. But shelters can come in different shapes and sizes, designed with a variety of purposes. They can provide refuge for days, weeks, months, and even in the most extreme cases, years. It all depends on the individual prepper's plan and budget. Riley Cook built a custom-made bunker cut into the side of a mountain where his family of five can hide for years. On the plains of Kansas, businessman Larry Hall is building an underground luxury apartment building to house dozens. But Ed and his wife Diana currently live in one of the most unusual and possibly extreme doomsday bunkers. They bought a retired Cold War era missile silo, formerly home to a four megaton thermonuclear warhead. I am preparing to survive and thrive underground. We live in a decommissioned Atlas E missile site. It's a very large underground hardened structure. Keeps us very safe from lots of things. The government spent $4 million to build this base in 1960. Ed took it off their hands for $40,000 in the 80s. It has 18-inch walls built to withstand a direct nuclear strike and a 400-ton blast-proof retractable roof sealing them inside. But this military compound was renovated for civilian use. Ed and Diana now make lunches where soldiers once protected launch coats. The couple removed the Cold War hardware and turned this, the former command center, into a kitchen. Toast will be ready. Toast is ready, yeah, yeah. OK, right. good. Pleasant, but the wind's down. OK. But preppers don't have to be quite so radical, living underground 24-7, or extravagant, spending 40 grand on a missile silo to protect themselves. More than a million shipping containers go into surplus each year. At approximately $1,500 to $4,000 each, they are an affordable prepper resource. On the Texas Plains, Vietnam vet Paul Range and his partner Gloria created a fortress by stacking their containers two stories high. Vineyard owner Mr. Wayne buried his container five feet underground, where the cooler temperatures make it perfect for food storage and use as a wine cellar. Tim Ralston plans to bury three shipping containers to house 16 members of his family. He spent six months planning the layout. I'm preparing my family for the total destruction of the power grid. Shipping containers used to transport commercial goods across the ocean can be 10 times stronger than a typical house. They are also rust, corrosion, and mildew resistant. Hello. Hey. How you doing? Tim Ralston, how do you do? Michael, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Michael. I'm looking to buy some containers. The reason I chose a shipping container is it's uh, already got all the reinforced walls. We don't have much time, so it's kind of already prefabbed for us. All we're doing is building out the insides. 
So what are you going to be storing in it? Me, my family. No, we don't have a lot of requests for, for burying containers to put your family in. And then I could do literally a bunk here, another bunk here. I love this one. You know, I love the extra, the height. So I think this is the one. Some preppers have different plans on how to best use their bunkers. John Major built a five by seven foot concrete reinforced foxhole to create a forward outpost to defend his home against intruders. To protect his family, Barry buried a steel pod under his garage that sleeps four people for a maximum of 60 days. But Doug Huffman, a retired defense contractor, has built a series of coffin-sized spider holes to defend his home. Home sweet home. I'm preparing for the second worldwide Great Depression. This is, you know, um, my last resort, but this is my guaranteed survival system. I've got half a dozen of these strewn over the next 200 miles up to uh, almost 9,000 feet. My plan is to retreat, ride it out, and live to fight another day. That's what the spider hole is for. And survival's the goal, it's into the spider hole. Man, it's cozy in here. <laughs> Shelters made from missile silos and shipping containers are designed for long-term living. But Doug has no intention of hunkering down for that long. Although he can stay in the spider hole for up to three days, at night, he will return to his ranch to take out the opposition. Welcome to my trap, said the spider to the fly. In the age of asymmetrical warfare, static fortress-like defenses can become sitting ducks. That's why some preppers choose to go mobile. Professional welder Riley Cook built a family-sized wagon to ford the rivers and streams of Colorado. Tim Ralston designed the solo trekker to haul supplies or even a wounded comrade in the Arizona heat. But some preppers prefer a little more horsepower. I'm preparing to survive the next Great Depression caused by a worldwide economic collapse. Like snails and turtles, Martin and Sarah carry their bunker wherever they go. They live and prep out of the 50 square foot sleeper cab in Martin's big rig truck. Hi, welcome to our home. <laughs> it's the size of many Americans' master closets and they have packed every last inch of it with their important supplies. I've got stuff stashed just about everywhere I can stash it in here. After the collapse, there's not going to be factories. I'm going to be able to make clothes. I have a stash of dry food, and I have two layers of it behind this cabinet. We have approximately four to six months worth of food in the truck. We stock up on our prescription meds by maybe skipping a day or two a month. They can't stay mobile 24-7, and Martin will have to pull over to rest. Since they can't bury their truck, they plan on hiding it. My little brother, who is actually bigger than I am, we call him Red. Red is retired from the Air Force. You're backed in pretty good with uh, concealment. He taught me many good things about what I need to look at as a mobile prepper. The main objective is to conceal from the roadway. And so we're going to set up some camouflage netting over the front and the sides that are exposed to any kind of roadway traffic to mix in with the local foliage. Martin believes that with their unusual mobile lifestyle, for he and his wife to survive when they stop moving, they must go undetected. <laughs> If you can take the time and exercise in the coming collapse, you can survive it. You may have to run. You may have to fight somebody physically. And if you're a fat ass, you may get in there and bounce them with your belly, and then you're going to have a vapor lock, otherwise known as a heart attack. Been there, done that, didn't like it. So you want to try and at least allow yourself the chance to survive. To survive in a world that they believe will have no supermarkets, many preppers store food from floor to ceiling. But some have prepared themselves and their children 
to eat just about anything. You gonna eat it? Um, sure. Preppers clearly understand that without food and water, they will die. The average body needs 2,000 calories per day to function at a minimum level. Food equals survival, and without an adequate supply of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, the human body will resort to cannibalizing its own tissue. This is stir fry. Uh, we've got crock pot right here. So who wants some ground out? All right. I'll have some, I'll have some. To properly stockpile food for future use, the storage space must be cool, dark, and dry. Since her husband does not approve of her prepping, Janet Spencer has hidden her extensive food stores in every nook and cranny of her home. Doug Huffman stores enough food in his underground root cellar to last him for years. But there are those preppers like John Major who do not have massive food stores. He is teaching his family to live solely off the land for their doomsday diet. I am prepping for a series of dirty bomb attacks. Look at that. So here you have the chicory. Why don't you check under that one? Anything? Uh, there's a cricket. You gonna eat it? Um, sure. Tastes like frozen cricket. Mm -hmm. It's like all crunchy and then it is like... Cream filled? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> On average, each cricket supplies his children with 13 grams of protein. The ability to survive with nearly nothing gives you a lot of freedom. There are six basic emotions humans feel. Disgust is the only one that children learn by watching the reactions of their parents and the culture they're raised in. My family gets a kick out of eating the bugs. Grab me what? the crickets. I am trying out a new recipe on my crickets with onion. Probably cover them in a little Parmesan cheese. Mmm, ew, it's wiggling in my mouth. <laughs> no way. No. That's actually pretty good. Even when I was giving my answer to him for the prom, he was coming out of the field with his gun, and I knew what I was getting into, I guess, from the beginning. But not too many families go and eat bugs together as a family activity. By normalizing the ideas of insects as food, Foraging for them during a disaster will seem like an everyday activity for John's children. Kaylee, would you oh, grab me a handful more of crickets, please? Is this bug stew? We're going to turn the mealworms into a big meal. Whoa, look at the huge one. Oh, yeah. That one's mine. Besides being high in protein, insects offer B vitamins and minerals like iron and zinc as health benefits. They are often described as tasting nutty. I cook my insects because I do have some standards for taste. Insecto parmesan. A lot of other kids think it's weird to eat bugs, but I think it's nummy. To simply survive, you need calories and vitamins, but food plays another important role. It can boost morale. Mike Mester's family has stored away jars of their favorite comfort food, meatloaf to get them through bad times. And it's quite tasty. Mr. Wayne is storing enough food so he and his dog, Max, will survive an economic collapse. Although they will never share the same tastes, they might have to share the same food. But Colleen Bishop takes the cake. She has spent nearly 20 years preparing and storing to be able to cook more than eight years of gourmet last suppers. I am preparing for a financial collapse, which will result in the end of the world as we know it. I think I might be eating a little differently than other preppers because I'm a foodie. Everything I have, I have for full flavor and gourmet foods. If the world comes to an end, I may be eating rice and beans, but they will be some kicking rice and beans. I'll be eating more things like beef stroganoff, chicken papacy casserole, cocoa van, four cheese Italian risotto. I'll be eating some good stuff. Colleen believes the value of the dollar will decrease so much that staple foods will become expensive luxury items. This is where we store all of our yummy freeze-dried and dehydrated foods. Just this closet alone 
We have enough for about eight people for three years. Colleen has mastered the art of jarring and canning. She preserves even the most perishable foods and then, unconcerned with refrigeration, stores them all over her house. We're running out of room for the canned chicken. This one won't fit. There's meat stored all over the place. <laughs> it's like, oh, excuse me, don't step on the meat. Under a doomsday scenario, I'll be the only one standing there who has another 100 pounds to lose. Everybody else will be skin and bones. <laughs> I'm grateful for a wife that likes to and is good at cooking. OK. It's something that gives you an edge in a doomsday scenario. Colleen and Scott know that in their community, if they are the only ones with food stores, they will not survive very long. They believe it is important to teach others how to prepare meals with shelf-stable foods. I might add just a couple pats of butter, because butter always makes uh, the sauce. How old are these eggs? They're about seven, eight months. Wow. Here's to eating well at the end of the world. Even over food and shelter, the U.S. military prioritizes water as the most important tool for survival. Survival can hinge on knowing your closest water supply and having a reliable filtration method. Although fearing an avian flu pandemic, Laura Kunze knows how to filter water from her neighborhood duck pond. Here's to the geese. Jeremy and Kelly have a private source in their own backyard, their hot tub. I am preparing for a collapse of civilization due to an electromagnetic pulse. Kind of looks like I was drinking beer last night. There's a head on that. There it is, folks. If their municipal water supply breaks down, Steve and Martha Pace plan to filter their own urine using a portable charcoal water filter. The charcoal is porous and catches impurities as the liquid passes through the filter, which Steve hopes will make his urine safe to drink. It's still got a slight yellow tint to Just it. Just a tinge. That's a far cry from what it was when it came out as a sample, wasn't it? Land yes. While it may seem dirty, fresh urine is sterile. A carbon-based filter can help to remove uric acid and, maybe most importantly, improve flavor. I claim it's not urine now. Now it is a clear, almost clear, clean, purified liquid water. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm amazed. Tastes like chlorinated water. Really? That simple. Hmm. Taste it. Just put it on your lips. If this was your last resort, you're going to do it to survive. Here's cheers to last resort. <laughs> Put a little bit of mineral oil on your hands and then slather it all over the egg, which is basically mimicking how they already come out of the hen, not allowing oxygen to get through. And they will sit tight for about uh, nine to 12 months in a cool, dry place. This goes fast. It is. Food, water, and shelter are the basics for survival, but preppers are always ready to defend what is theirs or lose it. I was just trying to help somebody. Many preppers believe that since they had the foresight to build bunkers, stockpile food, and store water to survive almost any apocalyptic event, they would immediately become prime targets for those who did not prepare. They're thinking that I'm, I didn't get food, but I can go take it away from Mr. Wayne. In a crisis situation, with police forces overwhelmed or unable to respond, preppers fear they will be left alone to defend themselves. What will you do when there's no one there? There are three specific types of guns preppers feel that they must have in their arsenal a semi-automatic for long-range hunting, a shotgun for short-range property defense, and a handgun for close combat. But for some, three guns is not enough, and they take their personal protection to the extreme. North Carolina prepper Pat Brabble owns the basic three armaments, rifle, shotgun, and pistol, but believes a few backups are essential. I'm preparing for the downfall of society through hyperinflation. There is 60 or 70 weapons that are in my safes. Pat Brabble is a prepper who feels that protecting his preps is a priority. He keeps his personal arsenal in a secret room in his barn. 
This first gun is an AR-15-223. Camp 45, the whole barrel is silenced. Bolt action rifle, 30 out 6 That's just a little 22 rifle. It's a little old 38. I use it for shooting snakes. I don't like snakes. The average attacker can cover 21 feet in 1.5 seconds. So Pat has tricked out his home so that he will be ready to draw a bead on an attacker at a moment's notice. The 9 millimeter with an ankle holster. It's made of sheepskin, so it's very comfortable. Just put it on, strap it on. Uh, nobody will never know you have it. Wear it to the mall. You can wear it uptown. You can wear it to Walmart. But Pat can fire only one of his hundreds of guns at a time. So if, as he fears, his home comes under concerted attack, he will need to bring more firepower to bear. Feel good? What? <laughs> An estimated 15 million women in the United States own their own gun. But for Pat, it is more about Lynette getting the proper training to ensure that she can handle everything from a 22 pistol to this civilian version of an M16. Oh, my wife is holding an AR-15. Some believe the AR-15 is the perfect semi-automatic weapon for women, since its limited recoil allows for more effective shooting by less muscular individuals. Semi-automatic, then we're going to fully automatic. Which one do you want? Fully, I guess. I'm not <laughs> going to say I'm going to empty the clip. It's got a 30 round clip in it. The military specs pretty much. To remain an accurate shot, it is recommended that you practice using a firearm at least once a week and to train using moving targets, since this better recreates what it would be like to encounter real attackers. Arizona dad Tim Ralston follows these principles when taking his sons for target practice in the desert. Take this rifle. Lock and load. We train as often as we can out in the desert. There's no restrictions like you would have in a gun club. So we're able to do more real life situation shooting. All right, so what we're gonna do, uh, balloons are gonna represent a good guy and a bad guy. All right, the bad guy is the red guy. Nice shot. Go, 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 get him, get him, get him. Again, nice shot. But on this day, he learned that even the most experienced marksman can have a misfire. What happened? Ooh. Get a truck up and ready. He's got to go to the hospital. Tim? Tim? Tim, look at me. Tim? What? what? Get this boy's out of here. As soon as Tim's gun went off without warning, shooting his thumb, the film crew's emergency medic, Jesse Ellerby, took swift action. His thumb, right between the two knuckles, had a wound to it. It channeled out the middle, essentially. It's still connected, or are you believe? Yeah, it's still on? connected. We evac to uh, a helicopter. Went to the hospital. They had me in emergency surgery within like an hour of me arriving. It was one of those malfunctions. My thumb went in front of the barrel, and uh, it went off. So now I basically left with a little midget digit, and uh, it looks the same. It's just much, much shorter with no knuckle. But just a few weeks after the accident, Tim was recuperating and no less passionate about the importance of prepping. An EMP does hit. It's going to get a lot worse than what this thumb accident happened. As a, a prepper, the most important tool is your mind. Preppers believe that having the right hardware for defense is important, but having just the guns is worthless without the proper tactical training. Martin Colville is a mobile prepper, so he can truck goods across the country. He, his wife, and his two dogs live out of the cab of his 18-wheeler. He thinks that during desperate times, his truck and his cargo will become a target of opportunity. We have truck hijackings that do occur when a collapse occurs, big rigs will be considered freestanding stores. Martin has enlisted his brother, Red, a defense consultant and former member of the military, to create a crisis situation exercise so he can test and improve his tactical training. We're going to see an 18-wheeler, and they're going to want what's in that 18-wheeler. Now that we're actually doing this hands-on exercise, he can better realize what he needs to do. Ideal crisis simulations should be as realistic as possible so they can be used as a predictive and analytic tool. Red has devised a scenario that he feels will mimic an actual event that Martin might encounter on the road. By faking an accident, Red has created a roadblock that gives Martin two poor choices. 
leave his truck to try and clear the path or turn his truck around. Either scenario forces Martin to stop, which immediately leaves him vulnerable to ambush. Yell out if you see something. Keep an eye on him. See if you see anybody move. Are you injured? My leg. Help me. You behind the Jeep, I can see your feet. Come on with your hands up. Marty! To your left, Marty! On the ground, on the ground! Back off, back off! Put your weapon on the deck! Back off! Down on the ground! I'm just trying to help. That's wide out. Arms straight. Spread your legs! I was just trying to help somebody. OK. Martin feels realistic training exercises are important okay. because they allow him an insight to his decision-making process, making him better prepared when they actually happen. So what should I have done? The minute you see somebody there, back away. My natural instinct is damsel in distress. Post-collapse, hey, it's you, it's Sarah, getting to your safe haven. Thank you, little well, brother. Not a problem, man. I appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> So you're never more than 20 feet away from a firearm in this house. One example is a small firearm and a number 10 can of peas. And I remember that because it's my pea shooter. Defense is a critical component of preparing for doomsday. But not every prepper plans to rely on guns for protection. I suggest that we all run. Redundancy is a basic tenet of prepping, having backups for their backups. So if guns break down or gunpowder becomes scarce, many preppers feel they need a plan that goes beyond bullets. Tim Ralston designed and built the Crovel, a multi-purpose tool that is customized to open a beer bottle, but also if he needs to defend himself, can chop a man or a pig in half. In the backwoods of Maine, Michael Douglas teaches his children to use an American Indian staple, the tomahawk, because they are silent, deadly, and are easily constructed from salvageable material. Nice. I'm preparing for the Yellowstone National Park supervolcano to explode. For New York City firefighter Jason Charles, knives are the weapons of choice. Jason lives in Manhattan, where handguns are heavily restricted, so instead, he owns over a dozen bladed weapons. It's a good self-defense weapon if you know how to use it. He believes knives are superior to guns for city preppers because they are lightweight, legal, and ideal for close quarters combat. <laughs> Hammer fist. To learn some basic knife fighting techniques, Jason practices Krav Maga, the official self-defense system of the Israeli army, with expert instructor Matan Gavish. If we come to a point where we deal with the end of the world, you want to make sure you're on the lion team in the jungle and not running around with the gazelles. Right into here, and that would, that would puncture the heart. It will die slowly and painfully, but surely. As a firefighter, Jason understands how important practical training is, so he's asked Matan to stage an attack in a more limited space. Open the door, get into the house. Please don't, I have kids. To create a sustainable food supply, many preppers add live animals to their doomsday preparations. Despite living in Pasadena, California, Jules Dervais maintains goats at his suburban home. Doug Huffman raises rabbits and names them after the recipes he will use for his post-doomsday cuisine. This is stir-fry crock pot right here. All right, we've got blackened. But suburban dad Mike Mester has no plans to make meals out of his pets because they are a crucial part of his home defense plan. Two German shepherds, storm and thunder. They're part of our family, and they're also part of our security. Like many suburban house pets, storm and thunder have a cushy life. 
But in preparation for economic collapse and the ensuing civil unrest, Mike fears, he believes these German shepherds' natural instincts will be important defensive assets. One of the things that I'd like to see if they're capable of mm -hmm. is providing a little bit more security. It's the training that makes the difference. It makes or breaks the dog. It actually makes or breaks the relationship with the family as well. Come on, come on, here, here, here. Good boy. Come Each on. of Mike's German shepherds has a natural fight drive. Proper training will allow Mike to control it. After some preliminary training, the Mesters get a close-up demonstration of what they hope Storm and Thunder could become, a trained attack dog. These dogs bite pretty hard. It's not something you want to take without anything on. So in real life, you can lose something. Okay. Just stops on her command. One advantage of a dog is that unlike a bullet, they can always be called back. California prepper Doug Huffman has an alternative defense plan. He believes that sometimes the best protection isn't to fight, but to hide. The most effective survival system is to disappear during the chaos and reappear to just take back what you've lost. Camouflage is Doug's weapon of choice. By tricking the eye into perceiving color and patterns as familiar objects, such as trees and fallen leaves or other natural surroundings, he is able to hide in plain sight. Doug has made over 30 camouflage ghillie suits, specifically crafted to mimic his Sierra Nevada mountain terrain. You have to have the different colors to fit your environment in fall, winter, spring, summer. The grass has changed, the snow, everything changes. Appropriate camouflage is a difference between life and death. Texas prepper Mr. Wayne plans on protecting his ranch with more than just bullets. The culmination of his doomsday defense plan ends with a bang. Kids, don't do this at home. Leave this to the professionals only. Very dangerous, very, very explosive. Mr. Wayne knows how to make a pipe bomb, which can pack the explosive power of eight sticks of dynamite each. He believes they are ideal perimeter defense weapons because they are able to disable or kill multiple invaders at once. Mr. Wayne plans to stop attackers with the strategic placement of explosives. Today, he and his cousin Jesse are going to field test the blast radius of their homemade pipe bombs. Hang on to this for me while I get this. Yeah. Any unwanted visitor attempting to look for safe cover on the property will find a deadly surprise, courtesy of Mr. Wayne. You don't want to go too deep, because you want the shrapnel to tear him up, too. I suggest that we all run. We better get around here before it goes off. Come on. All right, I, it, it's... <laughs> hey, it went off, didn't it? Well, it looks like he lost both of his legs. Yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere. No, nope. tape a couple of legs on him. I think it'll be all right. A good way to stop any vehicle is throwing out jacks. They'll puncture almost any tire. Guns and bullets can only go so far. If a situation escalates out of control, it is time to get out of Dodge. I get out of my way, I'm bigger than you. Any way they can. When disasters hit, most preppers' priority is to stay at home in their community. They will dig bunkers, stockpile food, and arm themselves to the teeth. But when things escalate to a point where they need to leave, this is called bugging out. Pulling out. Preppers recognize that the environment they will cross dictates the mode of transportation they will use. Some use four-wheel drive to avoid potentially dangerous crowds, road debris, and survive extreme weather, while others choose less conventional modes of transportation. 
I'm prepping for an EMP attack resulting in total chaos and riots. Barry is prepared to bug into the urban foxhole he built beneath his garage. But his family can only hide in there for so long before their supplies run out. If it goes past 60 days, we'll, we'll make our way to sea. Because I think you stand a much better chance surviving at sea than you do on land. Barry and his family plan to bug out on foot to a sailboat he keeps on Puget Sound. 60 days after the EMP attack Barry fears, the 17,500 people living in Barry's suburb won't have had electricity or running water for two months. So Barry is prepared to navigate a potentially volatile environment. The safest way to ever move when you're in danger is to move at dark. That's why uh, special forces operate at night. That's why the military operates at night. The cover of darkness can be your best friend. Let's cut across this way. The family travel in single file because it allows them to naturally camouflage themselves in darkness. They appear as one person from the front and rear. We'll be able to kind of creep silently. We'll be, we'll be dressed in dark clothing. We're not going to be easily noticeable. And just as dawn breaks, they reach the boatyard. From here, they will head to the nearest uninhabited islands and set up a temporary camp. I have a couple of islands that uh, are completely uninhabited in the North Puget Sound, and we'll immediately set sail for one of those. So do we look all clear, Bear? Everything looks great. Many preppers have a variety of vehicles for their bug out plan. But one prepper choice is a school bus because they are designed to protect children and can roll over and still keep the interior intact. School buses are built to exacting government standards and are among the safest vehicles on the road. Let's go, let's go, we're bugging out. I'm a prepper because I'm preparing for when there's the fan. Paul Range is retired from his corporate job and lives with his wife, Gloria, outside of Floresville, Texas. All right, guys, let's get going. Let's go, let's go. We're bugging out. We're running a drill to uh, make sure that we can load up in under an hour and uh, bug out. They drive specially customized bug out vehicles, secondhand school buses. We've got a house sitting on wheels. We took all the seats, but a few out. All right, guys, we have uh, 55 minutes to get the bus loaded up. Let's get going. Loose cans, loose cans, loose cans. Today, they are running a drill to see if they can exit their compound with their animals, approximately 10,000 pounds of food and 310 gallons of water in under an hour. We believe that we can survive for about 10 years with what we're going to take with us. Come on, goats. We're bugging out. Our animals are actually trained to bug out. Come on. Come on, goats. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We've got water. We've got food and kitchen equipment. We've got the medical supply. We're ready to go. Go, 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 go. Pulling out. The convoy of buses will travel to a pre-designated safe point two and a half hours from the compound. And from there, they will go to their final and secret destination. We have a specific time of the day that we are going to leave because we want to move through some areas in the dark and we want to move through some areas in the daylight. We can get to anywhere within the state without having to actually pass through a big city. One of the things uh, that makes excellent bandage material that's very cheap is um, maxi pads and tampons. They're built for absorbing blood. They're very absorbent. They're sterile. Um, so I stock up on a lot of those. In extreme emergency situations, preppers will bug out using any means necessary, land, sea, or air, believing that they'll have only one chance to make it and survive. My feet feel like they're about to fall off my ankles. When it comes to making a successful bug out, the terrain, population, and weather are all factors that will determine the exact plan. Megan Hurwitt knows that even in the best of times, her hometown of Houston has traffic problems. So she is forgoing a car and relying on her own two feet. <laughs> I'm preparing for a catastrophic oil crisis. Megan plans to bug out on foot. 
she believes all motorized transportation will be useless, making Houston's 50,000 miles of roadways a parking lot. I'm going to Mexico. With her backpack, a map, and a supply of water, Megan plans to hike to a car hidden close to the Mexican border and avoid the 2.7 million vehicles that could be stuck in a panic. It's going to be 10 to 12 miles, depending upon what I have to go around and what obstacles I'm going to have to travel through. The best time to do this would be right at dusk. That way, I'll have enough cover of darkness, but I'll still be able to see. There's a good chance there won't be any power, so I'll be completely in the dark for the most part. Soldiers in Afghanistan carried around 100 pounds with them on patrol. In a crisis situation, Megan will be carrying nearly half that amount. So to prepare, Megan spends four hours a day, six days a week, in training. She knows she won't make the trip unless she's in peak physical condition. If I hurry, I can be there in three hours. If there's blockades, it could take me all the way to four or five. When I do this for real, all this is going to be dark. Some of the sketchier areas, I was a little worried about getting mugged. It's happened to me before. It could happen again. I could handle myself. You do. I always carry a spare pair on you. Kind of getting tired. Uh, this pack's getting a little heavy. My feet feel like they're about to fall off my ankles. So it's been a long, long six hours. Hike uh, took twice as long as I thought it was going to. All right, I'm exhausted, but I'm losing time, and I'm almost there. Not much further. I'm by no means an expert at any of this stuff. Even with all of the preparation and all of the skill sets I'm trying to learn and all the foresight that I'm putting into prepping, if this hit the fan next week, I probably wouldn't make it. If it hits the fan in five years, I'll probably be OK. Preppers in mountainous areas, like Jeremy's family, often want a bug out vehicle that can handle the extremely difficult terrain. I'm preparing for the collapse of society due to peak oil. Jeremy and his wife, Kelly, live in Utah at the foot of the Rockies. They believe that an impending oil crisis will send America into chaos. If that happens, they plan to head to the mountains in the last thing that anyone would expect during a gas shortage, a retired army truck, which Jeremy calls the beast. If we do need to get out of town. We do need to leave our home and flee we have a vehicle to do so in. The M35 is a favorite transport vehicle of the US Army. It can carry 5,000 pounds of cargo off-road and up to 10,000 pounds on-road. M35 trucks are designed to run on a variety of fuels besides gasoline. Jeremy plans to use discarded motor oil. It's shelter. It's also transportation. It's got a huge compartment. We can put all of our water, we can put all of our food, we can put the bunk bed in there, have a um, place to sleep, and really shelter our family in. You want to learn to drive this thing? I sure do. I think it'd be fun. It's an army truck from the 70s. It doesn't have power steering. It doesn't have all the smooth transmission, shifting gears that our average vehicles do. Mommy's going to drive. How scary is that, huh? All right, let's do this. Let's go do some donuts out here in this dirt field. Here we go. We're going off road. Yeah, baby. Sanders sleeping through it all. Sorry, buddy. Aggressive with her. That was awesome. With enough alternative fuel stockpiled to take them 1,000 miles, Jeremy and Kelly can bug out to almost anywhere they choose. As long as I've got my son on my lap and my husband in the driver's seat, that's all I need. While no one is 100% sure of when the end of days will arrive, as preppers go to these great extremes and make enormous sacrifices to prepare for doomsday, one thing becomes clear. They plan to survive. I think that you need to be responsible for yourself and for your family. And to do anything less is a criminal act. Are you going to sit back and wait for the cavalry? They may never come. We all hope for the best but prepare for the worst. With Murphy's Law, Murphy said anything that can go wrong will go wrong. 
How likely are the events featured in this program? Most scientists, economists, and military leaders feel that in the immediate future, the cataclysmic events described in this show remain highly unlikely. However, government officials do recommend taking steps to ensure personal preparedness to cope with unanticipated events and disasters.